Monster Hunter Rise just recently released, and I've stuck in well over 100 hours at this point into the game. I streamed it live on my YouTube channel for a good amount of the game, actually, up until the final boss and some post game stuff. So I kind of just wanted to discuss my opinions, thoughts, feelings about the latest installment in the Monster Hunter series. Rise, for me, uh, takes all the quality of life improvements from World and Iceborne, takes the charm that previous games before that had, just blends it all together into a really great experience. So as we discuss, I'm going to go through different subjects such as story, visuals, monsters, and all that good stuff. Just going to go give a few thoughts about different sections, and we'll go from there. So first off, story. The story for Monster Hunter Rise is, well, serviceable at best. Granted, we have Monster Hunter Stories for a reason, and the spin-off series is meant for story stuff, obviously, hence the name Stories, and not really the mainline games. But I feel like there was a lot of potential for something good, or at least on par with the previous installment, World and Iceborne, but it's just not developed enough. There's really cool ideas, but it's just something to not even bother with until you really get to the current ending. And yes, current ending, which is one of my one of the few issues I have with Rise. The story doesn't really end when you defeat the quote unquote final boss. And we somewhat learned about this with the director if you notice in the QA in the digital event back in early March that we got. But it is definitely very apparent when you get to that point in the game. It doesn't ruin the experience, but it certainly feels out of place. I feel like there was really good potential uh, with the themes they had going and what they did with some undisclosed monsters in the game. But it doesn't go anywhere, I feel. Or it is going somewhere, but we don't really know. Well, we have an idea just not developed very well per se with it being a switch exclusive i honestly expected it to look all right okay at best in the demo i didn't think it looked too great but with the full release i think we got a really good looking game um i expected something not too great more like on par with maybe Xenoblade. Um, but what we got looks much better and looks good. And I would say it doesn't even just look good for a Switch game. It looks good in general. I think the style they chose for Rise in comparison to like what we got with the world. Where the colors almost feel like desaturated and washed out. Makes Rise actually look somewhat better in some regards. Um, monsters and the environments actually have some color. And Kimura, for sure, is booming with vivid and vibrant colors, such as the pinks of the cherry blossom trees, the deep greens of the bloody plaza, and the flames that come out of the towers with the dragon heads, which are placed around Kimura in some sections. Um, but yeah, th the areas in this game look great. And this kind of transitions us into the next topic, which is the locales. Frost Islands looks really nice. I love the snow, especially during nighttime. Uh, a lot of caverns in particular with the contrast with from the uh, very vivid cool blue of the water to the vibrant warm red and orange from the lava. That looks really good. And talking about the lava caverns itself, the volcano. I really dig the effect they chose for the volcano with the smoke. It has this very stylized feel. It looks really nice. Actually, all the um, special effects like element attacks look really good. I really like the style they chose instead of going for a more realistic approach. Except for the mud. The mud, yeah, that could be, get some work done on it. But like the fire, water, everything else looks pretty good. The weapons and armor all look great. Um, but up close, you know, when you get to like quest clear screens or whatever, they can look a little bit roulette, low res. But you're never that up close to them for the majority of the game, so it isn't really a major issue. Um, thank God. Thank God for unique weapon designs in this game. Uh, monsters uh, from the new world, though, such as Anjanath, do carry their previous slap on design. Um, 
Puke Puke, like I know Puke Puke's weapons are kind of like the defender look, the defender style from Rise, but it's still the slap on aesthetic. Well, slap on, yeah, slap on basically. They do look a little bit different, some of them do, but Anjanath actually the previous slap on design from World. And it almost feels unique now since it doesn't share any other parts with like the bone tree. Because that's what Anjanath's weapon was, a slap on on the bone tree in World. But it feels unique now and it doesn't look like any other switch axe present in the game. Um, so that's pretty nice. But back to locales. The new locales are all very distinct, all contrasting each other in design, aesthetics, and overall feel. For me, my personal favorite as of now is the Frost Islands, but the Lava Caverns and Sand Plains do come close. The Flooded Forest visually for me isn't that interesting. It feels more like something we would have gotten in the world as opposed to stuff in Rise. The Shrine Ruins I've also just been in way too much in the game itself as well, but also in the demo. I've experienced the Ruins way too much, but I still I still like the map. Um, I just prefer the other ones more. And I have to mention discussing with the maps, the secret endemic life, and in particular the one located in the Frost Islands, because occasionally during nighttime you'll hear this kind of ominous roar. And that roar comes from the Monk Snail which is probably the largest creature in this game. It's so weird when you first see it drifting across the ocean from where you're standing. Um, the other endemic life are also true, but I think overall the maps present here are really great and they all make good use of the wire bug. With maps like the sandy plains and lava cameras being a little bit more vertical heavy in some parts. And even the weakest link for me, the flood forest, I still enjoy. I'm just not too crazy about it and I think they nailed the direction for these new and revamped locales. The locale themes in this game I actually really dig for the most part. Again, the flooded forest for me is the weak link, but the sandy plains, frost islands, and lava caverns hit for me. With the sandy plains being my favorite theme. I mean, just, just listen to it for yourself. Also, the Lava Caverns I really digged, and it has this almost heroic and epic vibe to it. I think it sounds a, stands out a bit from the other locale themes. And something they did with Rise is basically just gave everything vocals. Every track in this game, except for I think Magnum Malo's theme, has vocals in it. From the start screen menu with Hinoa and Minoto singing, to area themes and unique themes for flagships such as Narcacuga and Zanoker, everything has vocals in it now. And I don't mind that. I think it's really cool sound design choice they went for with this game. And I think it works very well. So on to arguably the most important factor to Monster Hunter, the gameplay. Rise basically retains the core gameplay loop featured in other games, but makes it more fast, which makes sense being a portable game, but also the wire bugs and the palm you add a whole lot of mobility to this game, how you go about getting to the monster and doing your hunts. The palamutes allow you to also sharpen your weapon while riding, which <laughs> it just makes map traversal a breeze, both the Wirebug and Palamute. Overall though, hunts are fairly identical in previous games, just a lot faster, especially in low rank village where you can easily obtain sub 10 minute clear times, I mean easily. In low rank, you're gonna get very fast clear times. 
Um, uh, in a high rank, it you know it's about 15 minutes, but that's with little to no gathering, and depending on which monster you fight. Of course, if you fight, you know, for me, T Rex and Diablos are ones I struggle with a bit. But even then, I still get around 15 minute clear times. No problem. And then I like to go around the map and collect all the spear birds, honey, and all the other stuff. And also, endemic life like the puppet spider or stink minks whenever I can. There is also the addition of switch skills, which are just great. Having more options for the player is always a good thing in most cases. But once I got the sword and wyvern on the switch axe and the compressed discharge, I basically never went back to invincible gambit and elemental discharge respectively and i'm honestly just glad weapons have more moves in this game and kind of return some of the elements found in the hunter styles from generations wyvern riding is a new mounting system for monster and rides and it feels really good you can trigger wyvern riding you by using silk by moves or through the use of a puppet spider which can be found on some of the maps or just have monsters basically attack one another which sometimes can result in a rare turf war. I only saw one turf war my whole time until the final boss. That was Aknasom versus Somnicanth, which was cool, but turf wars are very rare in this game. And I don't think there are even that many in comparison to say world, but they do definitely feel far more unique, which is kind of a trade off. The losing monster in the turf war or just whoever attacks first will basically be put in a rideable state. And I vastly prefer Wyvern riding over the old mounting system in previous games. As every monster has a unique move set of attacks, such as the Great Azuchi with its deadly scythe tail that swings, Aknasom's elegant bashes and pecks, or Magnamala's long reaching tail strike and devastating mounting punisher that you can use to perform on other monsters. My personal favorite monster to ride is Somnicanth which charges and leaps into monsters to deal massive amounts of damage and its mounting punisher puts monsters to sleep before the Leviathan launches itself forward even more to shish out damage. Which I, while I felt the old mounting system that was present in previous games such as World and Iceborne was more of something you just did, it came somewhat tedious and Rise of Ivan Ryan still feels enjoyable after I put over 100 hours into this game and I think that's because every time you wyvern ride you usually have different monsters which means they all have different move sets which that's the big thing i think that really makes wyvern riding feel so much better um i still every time typically go out of my way to grab the pub spider or stink mink to trigger wyvern riding as you also get additional drops and even more part breaks which i know it seemed to come a lot easier with wyvern riding so Wyvern Riding feels far more rewarding than just getting a bit more damage out or staggering a monster with the old mounting system, which I really like. With Rise, we also have the new game mode, The Rampage, which is basically where you defend a Kamara and you, it takes place in the stronghold, the red stronghold. And there's a horde of monsters, you're essentially defending the stronghold. And you have access to a wide range of arsenals such as ballistas, cans, machine cans, dragonators, and even the splitting wyvern shot, which is essentially a nuke uh, that will easily make work of regular monsters. The rampage is in single player it is enjoyable, however, it's definitely a much better experience in multiplayer. However, when there is a special monster such as Apex Arzros, it gets insanely chaotic and it's just straight bliss when you first experience it. I will touch on this more later towards the end of the video in the spoiler segment, but for now, if you know, you know. <laughs> I will specifically talk about Apex Arzos, which is the first high rank monster you do find in the game, and is also the first Apex you encounter, which also, the Apex Arzos actually feels like a threat in comparison to its regular version. Uh, when Apex Arzos drops into the stronghold for the first time, and it roars, sends you flying back. It's just really good when you first experience it. Especially when you try rushing towards the very end of the stronghold and try to set up his defenses as fast as possible before Apex Arzos enters that last kind of arena area. It's 
really fun. Additionally, all the Apex monsters have a unique moveset and feel different from original selves, which is great. And they definitely feel far more deadlier. One thing I am somewhat disappointed about though is that they don't have unique armor sets or weapons. And I think a simple reskin of their original outfits would have been really cool to see, but it certainly isn't a deal breaker. Instead, we have Rampage skills, which allows you, allow you to customize weapons with a certain skill or buff. Some of these are simple like an attack boost or infinity boost. However, some weapons have unique abilities such as Magnamalo, Magnasol, which whenever the player is afflicted with Hellfire, their attack is raised. I really like Rampage skills and how they add a bit more customization and builds. But the really intriguing part of Rampage skills is the Rampage weapon tree. Which is essentially a Kimura weapon, but you can have up to three Rampage skills as opposed to just one on other weapons. These Rampage weapons probably in might end up becoming meta in the future once Rampage weapon tree is complete. And I imagine we'll get another upgrade for it with the release of Apex Raslos in the April update. The Rampage weapons for their skills or their upgrades actually all make use of Apex parts. So the first upgrade with the Rampage weapon is going to make use of an Apex Arzorus part. I believe it's a claw, I think. I don't remember exactly. But yeah, Apex monsters are for the Rampage weapons. And while we're talking about monsters... The monster roster in Rise is brilliant. It's a vibrant monster that feels very unique and varied with a wide range of types. One new Tenosteran, Amphibian, two new and two old Leviathans, Fang Beast, Bird, Brute, Fang, Pissine, and Flying Wyverns. There isn't a single monster in this game outside of a few of the Fang Beasts that felt like reskins. Even the series staple Rathlos and Rathian feel very different from each other. Especially with Rathlos focusing far more on breathing fire in this game. And Rathian bashing and poisoning. The new old monsters Anjan, Afjir, Toes, Kuyaku, Puke Puke, and Toby Kadachi all have been buffed in Rise, with Toby Kadashi no longer being a simple punching bag and Anjanath being even more of a threat than just being the first wall. Every returning monster in this game feels perfected, but this is the best version of them to date, and they all feature moves that are able to counter wire bug and soak by attacks, which brings them new life. Some of my new favorites from the revamped monsters include Anjanath, Baroth, Basarios, and the Great Baggy. Now focusing on the new monsters, simply put, they are all really great and well designed. There's no wink link, they can cast the monsters at all and they stand out from other monsters of their respective type. First off, the great is Zuchi, which is the first monster you face in Rise. Even though I fought him several times in a demo for Monster in Rise, he still feels fun and is a great starring monster with a scythe tail that he swings around which definitely teaches the player they will have to respect large monsters and invade their attacks and not slash away mindlessly. Just from a design perspective, I really like the vibrant orange collar and the raptor look, along with that curved claw at the end of its tail. It's also unique from the other great monsters in the sense that it actually works with its lesser versions. The regular small Zuchi will follow the great Zuchi's attacks, making great Zuchi feel like an actual leader as compared to the other greats such as Baggy or Rogi. Additionally, the Great Azuchi is one of my favorite monsters to widen raid, as its main attack is the three round tail swing that it does, which is always enjoyable to perform on a monster. Next is the Bird Wyvern Acnesom, which was the monster I was looking forward to the most from the initial trail that we got all the way back in September announcing this game. I love the design and it's very unique for a Bird Wyvern. It has a sort of parasol or umbrella that will form occasionally when it fights with its giant crest and wings. Its movement is very elegant, which is reflected in the clean design and embodies the nature of a crane. However, this one happens to breathe fire. Acnesom isn't a tough fight, but in terms of design and the personality monster, Acnesom is one of my favorites already. Also, the gear and weapons support this knight look, which I really dig. It's just unfortunate that Acnesom is one of the first fights in the game, so you don't really end up using Acnesom's gear 
or it doesn't really get too much to shine once you get to the stronger monsters. The big chunky boy is also a great addition to the Newcastle Monster Rise. Like Grizuchi and Aknasam, Tetrandon is one of the earlier fights, however he feels different from many of the monsters in this game, which is also aided by the fact that he's the only amphibian, which helps make him stand out even more. The fight with Tetrandon isn't too complex, he features dashes and swings as well as attempts to eat hunters, but still a fun fight nonetheless. One thing I really like about Monster and Rides is that even the early game monsters feel really fun to fight, even when you have overtuned gear. Discussing gear, however, I'm not a particular fan of the hard military style they went for. I feel like they could have incorporated its giant cell in a different way. Maybe focus on a more mesh-like approach with the armor, but that's just my opinion. Bishaw 10 is up next and is definitely one of the more unique monsters in Monster Hunter in general. With a large part of his moveset being throwing fruits at the player, which do damage as well as poison and paralyze, but he also has a fruit capable of flashing the player, which he slams with his tail while shielding himself with his wings. Which is a really nice detail that makes these monsters feel lively and beaming with personality. Special 10's armor is also one of my favorites out of the new monsters along with Athnasom, and the switch axe looks really cool too. When we were first introduced to Bishaw 10 at the Game Awards trailer, I wasn't really a fan of him, but over time I started to like him way more. And now that I've experienced this fight, I can safely say I enjoy Bishaw 10. One of the new Leviathans the Monster and Rise is Somnican, which at first, its design I found a bit off putting but quickly in the following weeks after the Game Awards trailer, I came around on it. And I absolutely am a fan of the design for Somnican. The armor is alright, no switch acts unfortunately though. However, it's armor I both use for Magmalo in the final boss of the game, so that's something. Also, didn't realize it had Divine Blessing until like the very end of the game, but yeah. I ended up making a sleep set utilizing the Great Baggy Switch Axe, though, and it turned out alright for me. Stomachant though is probably my favorite regular monster fight in the game, and I really dig its moveset. Its moveset feels very calculated, and I just really dig the personality of the monster. It's cool seeing Somna can't just float on the back as it swims away to a different location. I was actually expecting the other new Leviathan to be my favorite out of the new monsters, but I just really enjoy Somna can't's fight and how it makes use of sleep and smashes claims to do various status effects such as blast and stun. The personality, I bring it up again, I really dig. The other new fanged beast outside of Bishaw 10 is Goss Harag which I put as an S tier in my tier list video that I made. My first experience with Goss Harag was fairly negative, but as I learned the monster I came around on and started to enjoy the fight a lot more, to the point where it's one of my favorite fights in the game. I really dig the design and color scheme for Goss Harag, especially when it turns red and has the azure ice blades that contrast with the red arms. It's really great. Its attacks are fairly strong, but the monster feels has very well telegraphed attacks and a somewhat flashy style. All, all the while, which is great. Unfortunately, there just isn't a switch axe for Goss, but the armor does look cool, and it's definitely one of the better monsters out of the new roster. Next up, we have Omegron, which when I first encountered the game, I was amazed at how large he felt, and how big he still feels even finding him countless times later. Not only is he like double the size of you in height, but he's a lengthy boy, is the biggest regular monster in the game by far. I like all my drums design, I think the armor doesn't fit the monster's aesthetic, but it's alright. Also, Almutra's armor was straight up designed for the Switch Axe. I perfectly understand why the that's the armor and weapon we got for the Switch Axe in the demo. Everything just flows perfectly. Anyways, I think the fight could have been better, I guess. I think while Almutron being so big is a spectacle, it feels like almost he is too big, but I still enjoyed the fight. I really like when he goes underground and his head and tail are sticking out of the ground and he kind of looks like an otter. It's just adorable. Also, there's a certain thing on Mudron does that I was not seeing in the trailers at all, but if you know, you understand why his tail is shaped so weirdly. I think I kind of just expected more from Mudron. I hope they maybe do something more with him in Master Rank or give him a potential variant in the future that adds something to his arsenal. Even with the release of Monster and Rise, Ragnar Kodaki still feels somewhat foreign to me after finding it a couple times. 
The fight isn't unmemorable, it's just the fact that it's one of the few Hyrek only monsters and it's really only available in one quest. Plus the fact that its armor is really only made for the bow guns, which makes it a monster that I still haven't experienced much of. I'm glad Ragnar Kodaki is a Hyrek exclusive monster because there's seriously some other monsters in the game that should have been. But thought the fight was good. I felt like some people overhyped her a bit and made it seem like there was something crazy that happens. It's basically just a webbing effect, which is kind of a different version of stun. By all that, Rakadaki isn't at the very bottom on this when it comes to the new monsters, and it's still an enjoyable fight. Now, the flagship of Monster and Rise, Magnamalo. Magnamalo is amazing, and we already knew that from the demo. Magnamalo is such an aggressive monster, but also very flashy with the attacks being super well animated, and the Hellfire adds flair to his movements. His attacks are all well telegraphed, and Magnamalo feels truly intelligent with his wide range of moves, being able to strike the player in whatever circumstance. Magnamalo makes use of his bite, four legs tail, and he even launches himself to the player, explodes Hellfire, and absolutely nukes hunters with his signature attack. There isn't much more I really have to say outside gushing over this monster as it's easily one of my favorites. Magnamalo's armor and weapons are so far are my preferred go-to, with the sweat shacks in particular looking so damn stylish with one of Magnamalo's blades forming the sword and it's also engraved with purple flame detail that glows. It's great. Also, Wyvern riding Magnamalo and being able to perform the signature supernova as a mounting punisher on other monsters feels fantastic. Overall, Magnamalo is a great flagship and I really just wish he had more relevance to the story of the game overall because man, they did him dirty in that regard. Now, I will be heading to spoiler territory, but before that, I will give some closure to what I have already discussed so far. I think Monster Hunter Rise is a great game despite some flaws that are fairly big, with some of these issues potentially being addressed with future updates, I think this game will easily be a permanent favorite of mine. There's just some problems that should be kind of a big deal such as the blatant lack of an ending to this game which could be the result of working during a pandemic or the large scale ransomware attack that Capcom went through months ago. Maybe this is a decision they thought best instead of delaying the game when the majority of it is complete, I'm not sure. Despite me sounding very negative here, Rise is still a great game and I definitely enjoy it more than Generations, World, or Iceborne thus far. I'm sure wherever we get in the future will only further that for me. Now, we will be talking about spoilers here, so there is a warning. Set seconds to click off the video. It's pretty heavy spoilers, so yeah. And I think there's really some good stuff here that you definitely should experience blind. Anyways, here we go. Alright, now getting straight into spoilers, I have to talk about Wind Serpent Ibushi. Ibushi is hands down my favorite fighting monster in Rise without a doubt, and is for sure my favorite Elder Dragon, and probably my second favorite monster in the series. Ibushi isn't the throwing gladness as of now, but you know, Ibushi comes pretty close. You know, Glavness, I love everything about the design, fight, theme, armor, weapons, everything. But Ibushi, Ibushi comes close. Ibushi, I love the design for it. And Narwas too, they, they feel very majestic and mythical. There's a certain aura about them that other Elder Dragons really don't have, I feel. Like, they just feel like gods or deities. The glowing parts on Ibushi and Narwa kind of add to this. I think and they just feel like they emanate power from their design alone Abushi's fight it's just perfect for me when he comes down and immediately roar sending players flinging back Nabushi quickly makes work of the stronghold all the while an amazing theme plays in the background and I mean amazing the vocals from Anoa and the theme are really great and by far it is my favorite track from any monster in the game
Ibushi's relatively calm theme contrasting with his chaotic entrance and the rush that gets to the end of Stronghold is something that I haven't felt from a Monster Hunter game before. I think that's what really made this fight very memorable and what makes me put Ibushi on such a high pedestal. Now, Bushi's kind of a simp, you know. He's simping for Thunder Serpent Narwa, who is the current final boss for the game, and I was pleasantly surprised with Narwa as well. Not as great as Ibushi in my opinion, but a solid boss for sure, and a really well done fight that implements aspects of the Rampage combat, but also focuses more on the player using their own weapon. The fight takes place in the Coral Palace, which was something I definitely did not expect to see, especially when I first looked at the quest info, but the Coral Palace is a nice arena. Nothing too grand, but I really like the surrounding background and all the tall spires. If they wanted to, I could totally see this being expanded into a full map in the Master of G Rank expansion. And I could see it being a more aerial focused map that requires players to make use of the wire bug. Enough of the Coral Palace though, I really like how they actually integrated the whole rock levitating thing into Narwa's abilities. Also Ibushi, but it really only, Ibushi only really uses it in one stronghold attack. With Narwa in the setting of the Coral Palace being this kind of war-torn location with weaponry around, Narwa summons these rocks from the ground. They have ballistas and cannons on them, which makes getting these platforms really useful as they allow you to dish out heavy amounts of damage to Narwa. These rock platforms are also used to reward the player with easy access to the giant thunder sack located on Narwa, which is her primary weak spot. And there is one instance, I would say, almost like a mechanic check, where the game kind of just forces you to use the levitating rocks to avoid one of Narwa's deadly attacks. I don't think it faints, but it definitely brings you down to almost zero HP. You'll, you're close to carding. But yeah, overall, Narwa is a really brilliant fight. Very flashy, just fun fight. The theme's great too. It's just very good. Both Ibushi and Narwa are, yeah, they're my favorite Elder Dragons. Narwa, well, Narwa is probably on the same level for Val as Valstrax for me right now at least. That could change in the future though. One thing I have to say though is I felt like the Serpents are the true flagships of Monster Hunter Rise. Both of their silhouettes can be clearly seen in the logo, with the Bushi being the one on the right and Narwa on the left. And Magnamolo has such little story prevalence, it's kind of laughable. He appears in one cutscene as some major threat attacking an Arzuros and you know going after you the hunter but you kind of go out and randomly hunt the fanged wyvern down in a quest and it just I don't know it just feels Magnamala feels poorly used when it comes to the story and I know the story isn't the most important thing when it comes to the monster hunter games and I mean we have stories right that the stories is there for a reason but I feel like there's a lot of potential with Magnamol as a flagship. And I, I look back at like Velcana or even Nergigante, and they are very well incorporated into the story, even though they aren't the final bad guy or main antagonist, let's say. You know, there's in Nergigante case, it's Xenojiva, for Velcana, Sharish Valda, but they still feel very relevant to the story. and. They're the antagonist for the bulk of the game, whereas Magnamalo kind of just comes and goes. I don't know. Um, Magnamalo, I mean, he just doesn't feel as threatening as other monsters, I think, because they don't really show him off too much. I mean, he murders a tub of Gadashi in his intro cutscene. Okay, that's crazy, right? But there's just nothing really out of that, I feel. Like, there is that cutscene where after the rampage, you know, he's attacking Yarzros and goes after you, it's a player, but I don't know. I feel like Magnamala, they could have done so much more with him. I still like Magnamala, though, a lot. He's one of my favorite flagship monsters. Um, Lavinus, though, of course, you know. Lavinus is my boy, he's a channel icon. But yeah. 
I think Magnamala was definitely somewhat wasted potential. Still a great monster though, regardless of that. Getting back to the topic of Ibushi and Narwa, I feel like there really is good potential for something actually, you know, great. But I just don't know if it'll happen with the lack of story in this game. However, what story we have got so far with the two serpents is good. I just feel like they need more of it. So hopefully what comes with this update that fully wraps up the current story arc delivers. And I feel it has to. The story has to deliver whatever we end up getting. Because Ibushi and Narwa are really good Elder Dragons as it stands right now. And I feel like there's a lot of potential with them. I think they need to execute that. They have to. If they don't, that's going to be very disappointing. The Ibushi and Narwa are really good. And the ending isn't even in the game right now. So it's like, you know, the ending is not even in the game. It better be good. That's all I'm saying. Anyways, wrapping this up, I think Monster Hunter Rise is truly a fantastic game. As I said, it's already one of my favorite games. The gameplay in Rise feels so fluid and everything just flows so nicely. I love the wire bug in Palamute and how much faster Rise feels. The new locales are really great and exceed even the maps and world in Iceborne for me. And visually, the game brings back some of that vibrant color and charm that the previous entry lacked. The soundtrack of Rise is absolutely exceeds any other Monster Hunter game with its emphasis on vocals, making Ibushi's theme something very special. Rampage is promising I think it's a really good addition even if it's not preferred to the regular hunting. I like new ideas actually being explored and that is prevalent with the two main Elder Dragons, Wind Serpent Ibushi and Thunder Serpent Narwa. All the new monsters are fantastic additions to the series. There's more coming for the future of Monster and Rise, and even though in its current state it feels a little bit incomplete, I've had a great time with it and I'm enthusiastically waiting for that April update to release. But until then I do want to put more, a couple more videos out there. I'm going to wait to do an updated tier list video until the April update comes out. We already know Camillus is coming and Apex Rathalos. I imagine there will be three or four others that will get added with those. Um, I'm hoping for Basil Juice or Valstrax to return. But there is some decisiveness on whether the story's conclusion will be added in this update or the second one which is already confirmed i hope it's the first one um we'll have to wait and see though but for now that is all i have to say i'll hopefully be making more content in the future some videos similar to the one i made for magnum all in the demo now where we get news about that april update if you enjoyed this video i would appreciate the like or if you didn't enjoy the video dislike Feedback is always great, and subscribe for more Monster Hunter Rise content in the future if you've been enjoying the game like I have. Thanks for watching, and take care.